That's a long list of repairs, but I must get back to the surface soon. Where shall I start? Huh? Oh, we're on the science line. What's happening up there? Stella, we've got a question for you. Which weighs more, fizzy lemonade or flat lemonade? It's obvious. Flat lemonade weighs more. Fizzy pop's got air in it and air makes it lighter. OK. This glass of fizzy pop weighs 173.1 grams. You see all those bubbles? They make it lighter. Shake it and it'll go flat. Careful, don't spill any. Right, it's nearly flat now. Wait again, it'll be heavier. 172.6 grams. It weighs less now. Stella, why is the fizzy pop heavier than the flat pop? Think about it. It's easy to think of gases being totally light, even weightless. But gases have mass, like everything else. The bubbles of gas in lemonade don't weigh much, but they do weigh something. So once the gas has escaped, the lemonade will be lighter. The gas in fizzy drinks is carbon dioxide. My submarine is docked in a giant undersea lab, perfect for my scientific investigations. For my next experiment, I have a very special ingredient. flask of nothing. But watch this. It's a colourless, odourless, but heavy gas. Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide gas may be invisible, but look, it casts a shadow. Another gas in the air is oxygen. And like carbon dioxide, it's invisible. Usually. Oxygen gas passes through this tube into a copper pipe. The bucket contains liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees Celsius. Very cold indeed. After a few minutes of cooling, look at the end of the pipe drops of liquid. It's so cold that the oxygen gas passing through the tube becomes a liquid. It condenses. In this tube, there's a solid, bromine. This is liquid bromine. And now, the tube is filling with brown gas. Bromine again. The same stuff, but in totally different forms. How come? Matter, the stuff that everything's made of, is made up of many tiny particles. The behavior of these particles is what makes a substance a solid, a liquid, or a gas. In a solid, the particles are packed closely together in a rigid structure, vibrating about fixed points, but unable to move around. In a liquid, the particles can move around each other, so the liquid has no fixed shape, but they're still very close together. But in a gas, the particles are spread far apart, moving around rapidly and randomly to fill the entire space. Everything around us can exist in the three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. We get used to seeing them in the state we find them normally, at room temperature. But when conditions are more extreme, you can't take anything for granted. Extreme conditions? Sounds like a job for Femi. Novelty bubble bath, posh perfumes, 
hung here off the shade. I do a Christmas presents for Auntie Flo and Uncle Fred. They look quite at home here, don't they? But aren't they? The temperature of this cold room is at minus 30 degrees Celsius. I'm here to investigate how liquids like these cope with this chilly climate. These test tubes all contain different liquid toiletries, but after a spell at minus 30 degrees, are they still liquid? Aruna, the lab manager, helps me check them out. I think our big fridge has actually worked. Shampoo, deodorant, bath oil, bubble bath, liquid soap. All the toiletries have frozen solid. Apart from the perfume and the aftershave. But is this a problem? Our people down in the Antarctic face temperatures as cold as this, even colder. Aruna works for the British Antarctic Survey, whose workers down near the South Pole face temperatures of minus 50 degrees Celsius. So out in the Antarctic, the field workers can't take liquid toiletries like these for granted. They often can't even wash. That is completely disgusting. Mind you, at least it have perfume to cover up the smell. But there's some other liquids they just can't do without. These skidoos need liquids for fuel and lubrication. But how does something like engine oil handle the big chill? My standard oils lined up against Daruna's special Lubricant X. To pass the test, all the oil in the flask has to trickle through the tap into the beaker. Marks. Get set. Go! It's neck and neck as both liquids easily flow through the taps. But watch, my standard oil is getting thicker. It's definitely slowing down. Aruna looks pretty confident as her Lubricant X flows freely. Oh no, the standard oil's frozen solid. But Lubricant X is still a runny liquid. As you can see, your conventional oil would be no good at all in Antarctic. It freezes at about minus 15 degrees Celsius. So, Lubricant X, the only one to run the course. This is synthetic oil, and it's been specially made in laboratories and designed to remain liquid at very low temperatures. So, synthetic oil has a much lower freezing point than standard oil. Yes, lower than minus 56 degrees Celsius. Great oil. So isn't it about time they made a deodorant that doesn't freeze? The temperature of this fuel tank is still too high. As the temperature rises, solids become liquids. They melt. Even in here, it's warm enough for one particular metal to be a liquid. Mercury in the thermometer a liquid metal at room temperature. You might think that metals are solids, but of course, like everything else, metals can be liquids and gases too. This coin is made out of the metal gallium. It's a solid at room temperature. But gallium metal melts at 30 degrees. My hand is warm enough to melt it. Liquid metal in our hands. I can make a liquid out of a solid too. Liquid ice. Yeah, water. Put it back. Look at these three glasses. Which do you think is the coldest? That one, the one full of ice. Yeah, of course it is. Look. Zero. 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 Why? Until all that ice has melted, the temperature of the water remains zero. No higher, no lower. Melting happens at a fixed temperature for a pure substance. It's called its melting point. Over to you, Femi. Hmm. Hmm? My 
investigation starts here in this enormous antique centre. It's full of lots of interesting bits and pieces. Now, I could rummage around here all day, but Malcolm, the owner, has a job for me. Yes, Femi. Here we have three metal objects. Rather charming, actually. I like that one. Each one is made out of a different pure metal. Uh -huh. What I want you to find out for me is which metal each is made out of. OK, well, thanks for the task. Right, Every pure metal melts at a specific temperature called its melting point. Chunky science data books like this tell you the melting point of all the different metals. Looks like a great read. Tin, lead, aluminium, copper, iron, and loads of different metals. Could be any of them. But if I can find out the melting point of each of these objects, I'll be there. But where can I go that's hot enough to find out? Phew! I think I've found the right place. This is the rain foundry in Essex, and melting metals is their business. John's already got this crucible furnace stoked up to a high temperature. So which object's going to melt first? Whoops, in seconds, there's only half of Smiley Face left, but my other two objects are still solid. In goes John with a pyrometer, a special device to measure very high temperatures. So which metal melts at 327 degrees Celsius? Instead of trying to read these tables, I've got a more user-friendly device. The Science in Action Meltometer. 327 degrees Celsius is the melting point of lead. So the smiley face is, um, was made out of lead. Smiley's had it. All that's left is molten lead. It's the pot's turn to melt next, and my turn with the pyrometer. Okay. We'll have to hold that up here before I put it All right. Down. Yeah? 660 degrees Celsius, the melting point of aluminium. It's an aluminium pot. Well, it was a pot. Whoops. My last object, the lovely owl, is still firmly solid. It's not hot enough to melt him in the ladle. He actually has to go inside the furnace. Goodbye, owl. I'm ever so sorry. As the poor owl gets a roasting, it's back to work at the foundry. The foundry melts metals, then pours the liquid into casks. The metal cools and solidifies again into the shape of the cast. At last, the owl's finally melting. He's history. One thousand and eighty-four degrees Celsius. My owl was made out of copper. Oh no! What am I going to do with this? I found out the metals. What am I going to tell Malcolm? Okay. Fortunately, John's got an idea to recast the molten metals. Well, there you go. A beautiful set of dinner plates. The... But my owl, my, my lovely smiley face. Uh, well, how about I throw in the meltometer as well? I don't really want a meltometer. Oh. Feeling hungry. All those submarine repairs have given me an appetite. A two egg appetite. One in each pan. I'll just turn this one down, but I'll leave this one turned up full. So, which egg is going to cook first? Truth. 
the soldier test. Exactly the same. Like melting, boiling occurs at a fixed temperature for a pure substance. So as long as it's pure, boiling water can't get any hotter than 100 degrees, no matter how much you heat it. Meanwhile, Femi's on her way to investigate another process, evaporation. experiment. I'm at the garage. I had to get some petrol. What? You're on a mobile at a petrol station? Yeah. Get off the phone and switch it off sharpish. Hi. Sorry I'm late. Well, at least you're here in one piece. I was a bit worried about you on your phone at the garage. Why? Well, you should never use a mobile phone, light a match, smoke, or do anything else that could cause a spark at a petrol station. Your petrol's very dangerous and a spark from any of these things could cause an explosion. Richard's lined up a demonstration to show how dangerous petrol can be. He's pouring petrol onto the fire. Richard, why does the petrol not just burn, it also seems to explode? It's because it's not just the liquid petrol that's burning. When the petrol ignites, a petrol vapour, a gas, also ignites. So it's the burning gas that causes the explosion? That's right. Whenever you leave a liquid in the open air, some of the liquid becomes a gas. It evaporates. Unlike boiling, evaporation happens at any temperature. Petrol evaporates very readily and is highly flammable. An explosive combination. How do firefighters tackle such fires? Well, one of the things we can do is actually cover the leak with a foam blanket. This prevents the vapours from escaping into the air. So when there's no surface area of the liquid exposed to the air, there's no evaporation. That's right. But before I go, watch this. How do you lift an ice cube? with a piece of cotton. What? Did she speak on it? Looks like salt. It's melted the ice. Why? Maybe it changes its melting point. Yeah, it's only pure water which has a melting point of zero degrees Celsius. I think salty water has a lower melting point. So that's why they sprinkle it on ice and ruins. To melt the ice. So the ice melts and the thread sinks in, but then the water freezes over the top of it. 